tena koto kato ka bobo na moanga ka tawan awa ka Peter Cleary tuko inwa noa Melbourne Australia aho kai Philip Island Malau Bunarong and Bunarong aho ho e noho wana he kai mahi aho mo Philip Island Nature Parks noraya tena ka koto tena koto tena kotu kato tena tatu katua. Tena koto katoa, ko dandinong, Mount Dandinong, to Maunga, ko yara, to Awa, ko nerim, to Moana, ko Scottish, to Iwi, no Narm, Melbourne, ah wow, no rera tena koto katoa. Thank you for such the warm welcome to New Zealand and what a fantastic conference it's been. It's been an absolutely engaging, uh, very inspiring and um, I feel very privileged to be part of what's been a great range of presentations. So our presentation is on becoming a more emotionally healthy ranger, which is um, a journey we began in 2015 when uh, one of the board members of the Thin Green Line Foundation, Brent Masters, who worked with Jolene to bring the Solomon Island Rangers Association into being, suggested that at our Phillip Island um, National Rangers meeting, we should um, consult with Gail from the Global Leadership Foundation about um, emotional health. And we um, took his advice and we've begun a journey on emotional health. Uh, there are some workbooks. Uh, which you can read about this topic. And I took one of those and for a few years, I absorbed what I call the mantra. And then in 2019, I phoned up Gail and I said, would you like to present with me in Nepal on emotional health? Because I think it is a very important topic that we need to uh, talk about as rangers in our jobs. We did that, we got some very good feedback including um, someone who came up to me and said, why weren't we talking about this 10 years ago? And I said, yes, well, this is where we're at at this point in time. So then along came the pandemic. And you know, what's one of the greatest uh, fallouts from the pandemic is people's emotional health. So we got a little bit above the, the curve there. And um, last year when Gail invited me to her Christmas party, which is a bit of a annual event, and Michael's joined me and a few other people have helped keep that relationship going between the Global Leadership Foundation and the International Rangers. I mentioned there was a conference on in New Zealand and if we could uh, do another uh, presentation which we're doing today. And we devised a, um, a strategy and Gail said to me, do you think you can source a number of emotionally healthy rangers from around the world and we'll interview them, um, get some of an idea of what an emotionally healthy ranger looks like. And so I was able to go through my um, inbox and we interviewed rangers from South Africa, Romania, Australia and retirement. <laughs> and then we got a guidebook that was ghost written so our ghost writer who conducted the interviews then put it into a working document which we now have available for us. And basically what it is, what's about emotional health? It's about us evolving and improving our mental health so we, we can be more effective in our roles. So emotional health is in our definition a state of enhanced well-being and that's created through very conscious choices, mindful practices and respectful relationships. And I can't tell you what an honour it's been to be part 
of such respectful and mindful and conscious practices that I've experienced in these two days. And before we start the process, I do, um, on behalf of Pete and I, want to pay our respects to the elders who were with us yesterday and to all of you for your graciousness. We also want to acknowledge the countries that we both live in in Australia. I'm on Wurundjeri country, Pete's on Bunurong country, and we want to acknowledge the amazing connection, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and their connection to earth, sea and ocean and the sky. And also to acknowledge that the land was never ceded. So we do want to make sure that we put our respect into this, into this beautiful setting so that you understand where we're coming from is to practice what we preach. So with that, I want you to think of a good day. A great day at work. You walk in, it's fantastic. You go, yep, great day. And then I want you to think of a day when you've gone, never again. I am not coming back. I'm thinking about your experience of not having the job and what it feels like when you put such energy and time into something and then to see it disappear. I want you to think of the difference, to feel that experience, and it won't be long if I kept talking about things that are not okay, that the whole room will be going, I'm out of here. I didn't want to be here in any case. Because what happens is that the brain's working overtime to keep you safe. And when we're in a space where things aren't working, it's really hard to stay above that line. So just think of the triggers. It's a great day, but then suddenly somebody presses that hot button. Anyone here have a partner, a sibling, a friend that when they press that hot button, you just simply react? And when we're in that space, we talk about going below the line. And below the line is an important place to go. If we didn't go below the line, we wouldn't know what to do. So we need to understand what those emotions feel like, to understand what it really does feel like to be below the line. And when that button gets pressed, what happens? I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, but if anybody breaks in a car in front of you in Australia, what are the things that we do in Australia to let that person know <laughs> that we're not particularly happy? Yeah? Finger in the air, hand on the horn, we start shouting. Anybody do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you, honest ones. <laughs> so when we're in that space, and that's a very simple example, we simply react. There's no thinking. But let's go a bit deeper. When was the last time you delegated? And here are the excuses. My team's too busy, I'll do it myself. If you want it done perfectly, it has to be me. Nobody else knows how to do this, I'll do it myself. So all of these are strategies for trying to cope with the situation that we're in. And often those strategies aren't the most effective. And generally what happens, we end up in this space where we're blaming, we're defending, we're denying, we're justifying. And ultimately, if we keep going like that, when somebody tells you you're not good enough or not smart enough, when you're in a park and somebody's abusing you because you've talked about them and their dog, it's really hard to stay above that line. And ultimately, if we're always in that place, we quit. We quit emotionally, we quit mentally, we quit physically. We'll only do what's expected. When we're above the line, a whole different story. So come back to that place when I asked you what's a good day at work look like. And I love the one where don't, uh, don't work too hard. <laughs> Come above that line and think about a good day at work. Think about the difference, how you feel. There's a connection between the physicalness of us, our body, our heart and our head. We're connected. We feel like we're in the right place. And guaranteed, if that's where you are, there's something different happens. Instead of quitting, we give more. I've been hearing that for two days. The amazing discretionary effort that you, you give to your communities, to the people around you, to your work. 
that's above the line, that's being emotionally healthy. It's about an enhanced state of well-being and it feels right. You feel good in yourself. It's about conscious choices. You're not reacting. You're in a space where things just seem to flow. Often people will talk about in the zone or present. You're in a space where the relationships are respectful. But how in the heck do you stay there when there's so much around you every day that keeps pushing those little buttons? Anyone have teenagers, adolescents? Anyone been one of them? Yeah? <laughs> we all know what happens. When that button gets pressed, it's really, really hard to stay above the line unless you know what's triggering you. And most of us don't sit going, gee, I wonder what's triggering me today. We just simply react. But the more we know about those triggers, the more we, we can be ready, we can prepare. And Pete's going to talk about what emotional health has meant to him. Because in the work that you all do, guaranteed, there are moments, hours and days where you spend trying to stay out of here, but it gets really hard. Thanks, Gail. So my emotional health journey, what are the things that send me below the line? What are the triggers that send me below the line? And this is what I've learned through this process and continue to learn. The first trigger for me is fatigue. If I become too fatigued, my personality changes, I, do, I don't operate in a normal way that people are used to, my decision making is poor and those sorts of things. So when I start getting tired, it's like, I can't be here right now. I'm aware of that as a trigger. Physical injuries is um, another one for me as well. I'm an active sportsman. So I've um, torn my calf a couple of times, done groins, done hamstrings, hurt my shoulder. I, t I do continue to be active and I do, uh, we have to do our firefighting training every year, which is a task-based <coughs> assessment where you have to walk um, 3.2 kilometres carrying 11 kilograms in 29 minutes. So I like to be active as a firefighter and so I have to keep myself fit and I need to be aware that I can't push my body too hard. I'm not 30 anymore, I'm not 40 anymore. So I'm aware of physical injuries. They um, affect my mental health. And the other one that I'm aware of, and especially during the pandemic as well, was, is other people's lack of knowledge or their general ignorance or not being in touch with reality. Sometimes I find that really difficult and that sends me a little bit below the line. So, um, having worked on this model, and I do have um, quite a lot of confidence and self-assurance, and I have to also be aware because this creates anxiety for my superiors. So, because I'm self, so self-assured and, and know with part, which path I'm treading at times, um, my seniors in, in the organisation have to remind me of my role in my team and um, how that in influences other people. So that's a another thing that I've become aware of through this process. And through this, it's kept me secure in the knowledge that I need to keep improving my emotional health and this is a part of a journey. So they're the, the things that send me below the line. And what it, through this, what has um, put me above the line is that I have confidence and self-assurance, as I, as I mentioned. It allows me to have greater integrity in my um, conviction and style of my work. Um, I believe that I develop really good strategies by having clear thinking, but by being above the line and promotes me to have engaging conversations, both with staff and visitors. And I love meeting Gail occasionally, often, frequently. Every day I meet Dale, Gail is a good day because I learned something. So she, the last time we had a meeting, she was talking about listening without knowing, listening without judging, listening without interrupting. I have to bite my tongue at times because I like to interrupt. By doing that, it gives me the ability to create time. One of the greatest things about being above the line is you create time for yourself. Less haste, more speed. 
are much more aware of intrinsic values these days. I'm a little bit extroverted, but I don't need extrinsic values. I don't need recognition anymore. I've moved beyond that in terms of my emotional health. I tend to act more altruistically now. So when you have a look at the mantra, that's when you were going up towards stage three. It allows me to call it, connect more with my colleagues in terms of mentoring, teaching and coaching. So I have the confidence to be able to help my younger staff, talk them through life, through work. And as we were talking with Tim from um, the CEO of the Thin Green Line last week, he made a very good point is that we help, it's about, if you're in a high level of emotional health, you can drag other people up above the line. So you're bringing people up with you. And I'm sure you've been um, there at work on a day when you're feeling really good, and I'm sure that that's when you've dragged people up with you and really said, come on, let's do this. It's not as bad as it all seems. And that's um, when you're operating above the line, that's more and more the way you're going to, uh, to be. And I will um, continue to strive to stay above the line and go further above the line so that my emotional health is higher and then I will be the Zen master <coughs> in the zone and that's what I'm aiming to do. So um, it is a challenge, it's a journey, but it's a really good and important skill to have. So what we're going to ask you to do, just with the person next to you, is think of a situation that really triggers you and sends you below the line and what's the impact on you and on others. Don't just think about others because it always has an impact on you as well. And then I want you to come back up above the line and talk about a situation where you feel at your best, when you're in the zone, in the flow, when you're feeling as though you can do anything and you do. So just very quickly, so I've only got three minutes, just quickly with each other. Situation first, below the line, and then one above. <laughs>
It's really important if you're going to work in situations where you are dealing with negativity, where you are, in a sense, having to sit with situations below the line, that if you can, at some stage, it's really good to come back and remember or create a, a happy situation, a fun situation, simply because the brain chemicals work over time on staying alert. So the more we spend below the line in that discussion, the harder it, get, it becomes to get above. So if we can bring the different brain chemicals back into action by finishing on a positive, then we walk away feeling better. Part of the work that we've been doing, and we started way back in, in Nepal, was to start asking all of you what really does trigger you? What sends you below the line? And what are those techniques that you use to get you back above? And at the moment, we've identified four categories. There are more, but this is where the data's been coming. And this comes from the Victorian Rangers Association. So we got together and started to talk about what are some really practical techniques for getting above that line when we're in difficult situations? And as Pete said, our book, which is generally just used as a, a guide to our frameworks, now includes practical examples from the ranges that were interviewed. So what you'll find in here is real life stories of what people do to get above that line, what they find is important in their practices. So we've put down what it is that the, the group identified when we started to talk about human wildlife conflict where we started to explore emergency management and response, compliance and enforcement, and visitor interaction and public safety. And surprise, surprise, the examples will fit in many places. They don't necessarily fit in one category. What we're asking you to do today, a couple of things, is we've got a blank sheet, and we'd love to get your examples. We're not going to catch them um, as a large group. We, at, we do have afternoon tea coming up, so the incentive is there's some pens here and we'd love you to come and pop your examples up. If you are worried about the handwriting, which I know some of you have already gone, oh, God, I'm coming come up and putting something up there. There's the below the line behaviour. You know, you are, it doesn't matter what your handwriting's like, because I never learnt to print, never learnt to write, I had to learn to print. If you don't want to do that, we have sheets here. And the question is, what sends you below the line in your work environment and what are the practices that get you back up? So you can do that. And our reward, because we only have 50 booklets, is that if you do either of those, we'd love to give you a booklet. If um, there are more than one of you in a workplace, if you could share the booklets, that'd be great. So we're not, we're not preventing you from coming and getting a booklet if you don't do any of the, what I've suggested. And we can also email you the book, so it's a PDF version as well. So what we're really keen to do is keep building practical examples. It's very, very important that we get your words, your language, your stories. What we know is that these two days have brought such gifts in terms of what we've learnt from each other. And we want to continue this learning. So by the time the next range of Congress is in place, We've got almost like a, an encyclopedia of practical examples because we do a lot of work and a lot of professional training around our technical skills, a lot of application of technical work. We often spend very little time looking at us. If I was to tell you that each one of you is a leader, some of you will go, no, no, not, I'm not paid to do that. Mm -hmm. However, what we know and it's been said today and yesterday, you're the front line. You're the face. You're the people that people look to and look for. And how do you show up? So for us, the more emotionally healthy we can be, the more above the line we are, the more prepared we are, the more constructive we are, the more respectful we are, the more mindful we are. Thank you. OK, we'll throw it to the floor now. Has anyone got any questions or any insight? Sure.
Yep, very often. So burnout is is something, fatigue, um, those things that really drive people below the line. Yes, that comes up very often. So, um, and that's, as I gave in my example with fatigue, um, I need to strategise and, and have ways in which, you know, um, what we really don't want, and, and I remember even talking to Sean Wilmore when he was running the Thin Green Line about him being burnt out and wanting to throw in the towel and everything like that, and I said to him, mate, it's really important that you keep this going because you've done so much work. The last thing we want you to do is burn out and fall over because, A, where are we going to get someone else who's going to do what you've done and what you've achieved so, so much already? So I said to him, you know, you just need to... Um, he was suffering from PTSD, from having to deal with so much um, death of rangers and being at the front line, um, going and talking to their families um, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, you, you need to be really aware. Um, and, and one of the essences of this is self-awareness, to know exactly where, where you're coming from and the proactive approach so that you know, OK, so um, I'm not going to go to work today because... I don't want to have a conversation that's going to send me behind the, below the line and do something that, you know, is is going to be a breach of a code of conduct or, you know, something that... And so, therefore, if someone does that, we would describe that they're very emotionally healthy because they know that, that, that they're in that state of mind and so they just need to, to chill out. Yeah. The so, other thing we know about burnout, I won't leave the mic. Um, the other thing we know about Generally, the disconnect will be when we don't bring the third centre in. So, for those of you who work with animals, you'll know immediately what happens when people are connected to an animal. There's, there's a heart connection immediately. It doesn't matter what it is. And so, what's interesting is that when we ignore that or dissociate from one of them, we tend to find ourselves stressing and burning out more. So, if we bring a balance back, and I'm traditional, traditional. Um, Communities know this work, Eastern communities do it. It's this sense of integration rather than trying to keep my head separate from the rest of me or keep put my little part at the door and leave my feelings alone. So we need to bring back the work. And, and one of the best quotes that I've heard in recent times is that I'm just recovering before I get tired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recovery is very important. Productivity, recovery. You, if you you want to, you don't want to go burn out. You want to stay in those two top quadrants so that you can recover. Whether you need to take leave, not do too much on your weekends. You know, when you've got a, a family, life is very busy. When you're a family, sometimes I say I don't have days off. I just have days when I don't go to work. I'm sure a lot of parents can appreciate that from time to time. So yeah, it's it's really. And you don't really want to be falling over. It's it's a massive impact on our economy as well as all those other um, flow-on effects of that. So it's really, really important not to burn out. Sure. I was interested to see in the most sport thing there that there wasn't uh, or management yeah. Yeah. You'll win so, a book for that. Yeah, we, we actually had a very big conversation about that, but these were our four categories that we worked on on the day. We love that. We've got a lot of data already. We just haven't added the category. I know if we did, we'd have another whole session. Yeah, so we do have another, um, a couple of categories. Um, the political landscape, yeah. um, the cultural landscape, you know, cultural safety, cultural sensitivity. Um, those sorts of things impact upon certain people um, in, in the workplace and those sorts of things. So we, we have a lot more, a lot more topics to um, to delve into, and uh, those sorts of things and those sorts of ideas we want to really drill into so that we can produce the best product possible. So anything that you can add to the conversation. Um, into the journey we're on because we want to produce the best result going forward and we know it's going to be in a, an evolution, especially with things like climate change coming on board and <coughs> frequent events and intensities and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I, I think 
you mentioned climate change, but there's also <laughs> social license and um, and public opinion for the work that you're undertaking. Yep. Yep. So yeah. you you know that to the list that we're going to. The other thing that we want to do is bring it to a point where we have a series of workshops now that we've been working with and we want to work with you to take them to your communities. So what we've got is the basis and frameworks that are fairly universal, but your examples and what you've just raised then, the examples are so important to be um, specific for your communities as well. There's no big bunch of things that's going to make a difference to everyone. We need, we need to find the things that work for you. Sure. Uh, just with the trip, like most ranges, uh, have been impacted. Um, Kia ora tātou. Um, just want to share something which is all just to add on to the lovely kōrero um, about keeping ourselves above that line um, and not staying below it. Yes, we acknowledge we sometimes have to drop below um, in order to get back up. And it's something, something here in Aotearoa, especially us Māori and some of the colleagues here from Te Papa Atafai will uh, understand this as something we call Te Whare Tapa Whā. And it's the house of well-being. And it's respecting that whare, that house in all four corners it represents. And to us it represents the spiritual, the, uh, the physical, the mental, and also your family. So um, with either one of those out of sync, um, you know, it's, it's very hard um, for us to, as individuals, to keep ourselves up. So we also need to understand our family is very important. Um, mental, well-being, uh, spiritual as well, and also, um, yeah, our bodies. So that's something I just wanted to share here. So I think it was very, very important. Kiora, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, just two months of downloading from range is a bit intense. Um, but, um, uh, something I came across, um, it was developed in Australia, it was training for resilience. So it's called Mind Armour, um, and I think it would be great if we could count agencies to actually pay for this amazing product, which was developed for first responders in Victoria, so Australian first responders. So obviously we're not acknowledged as first responders because kind of understandably our agencies don't want the financial liability or the overall liability of actually having to acknowledge us as first responders and the costs and training and everything like that. But this is resilience training for people who are exposed to traumatising situations where we could have all new staff and all existing staff have training which gives them the skills and tools that they need to not prevent being traumatised, that's impossible to do, but to reduce the likelihood that you'll have a lifelong impact on your mental health and so that you can support your colleagues, so you can stay healthy at work. Um, unfortunately, it was presented to Victorian Parks and they refused to take it on board. Um, but I think it's something that all of us as range associations <coughs> can support and recommend to our agencies and perhaps work with um, the creators of that. So it's Macquarie University, the Black Dog Institute and um, Metro Firefighters Victoria. Because that would be a real game changer, I think, for a lot of our staff. So it should be a basic part of your induction, where you don't just get induction on doing the dangerous things, um, but you get induction on how to be safe at work. So whether they call it, they don't call it first responders, we know that, you know, in MP, you're dealing with fatalities all too often, you know, um, and in dealing with major wildfires, or working in really remote areas where you will be the first responder for days, you might have to stay with the body overnight, and that's not really fair and that's, we're not prepared for that. But with that kind of training, I think that's, yeah, a really, really important thing. So um, it'd be great if we could advocate for that to happen. And I'd like to, through my trip, challenge those agencies, because I will be going back to executives to report back on where they sit in our region in terms of where they're achieving, where they could improve and things in other states and jurisdictions that could assist them in their area. So there's learning to sort of start that ball rolling to looking a little bit deeper than just the most basic things of 
fires and those sort of critical things that when they have those cross-jurisdictional meetings with executive, they never get past that to staffing and the things that really impact us on the ground. So I think it would be really great to, to challenge them to, it's an investment in what they're having problems with, but it's huge vacancies, retention of staff, trying to keep younger people who will jump careers, when they don't feel supported, we will just jump. How do you keep them in? You support them, you give them the training they need to stay safe on the job. So. Um, I mean, I missed what the training was called, but mm -hmm. Parks Victoria has just put all its staff, as many as it wanted to, through trauma training. Yes. Three tiers. So for dealing with incidents, dealing with people and yourselves at incidents and then post incidents, all the way up to dealing with trauma uh, fatalities. So we've just done that. It's through Phoenix Australia. I'm not trying to take business. No, 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 no. That's fine. And we've we've done done mind arm our yeah, yeah, so yeah. we've just all done that, which has been yeah. really good. Well, not everyone, but we have the ability to do it. It was actually offered free of charge to us, which was just fantastic. Yeah, which, which should be, I think, expected. Yeah. Um, WA Parks actually have an amazing model of peer support network. We have one in New South Wales following the bushfires. That was sort of the, the real... Uh, catalyst because we were losing so many experienced staff who were retiring because they were absolutely emotionally burnt out or had PTSD from the fires. Whereas WA have been developing this since 2008. Imagine if they were connected with our other agencies, we could have these models in place already. They'll actually fly up and hold us up to you if you're in a remote area and support you. Like that's the kind of care staff that they've learned from the mining industry that I think we should start to expect from our agencies. And if that's how you can start. One of the things we need to do is challenge, challenge our agencies, because we did challenge Parks Vic, and people know I get fatalities quite regularly in my park. Um, we are classed as first responders under the Emergency Management Victoria Act, but there's a difference between first responders and first response, and that's where the conversation is. Our people in my parks are usually first on scene and only people on scene for hours until ambulance or police come. So we're working through policy change, trying to differentiate between first responders, first response, and what levels of training and support to provide to each of those. We've actually just got parks over the line, which has been a really <coughs> long journey, but we're getting there. Yeah, it'd be great to see that influence across all agencies. Yeah, yeah and it's a, a, the agency knows that this is a huge risk. And that's why they're, it's, a, it's a bit of a, they're probably just getting their ducks in a row to know how to approach this situation, but they know that it needs to, this needs to be in the conversation and is a part of the um, current work scene. I just so don't want to ring the bell, no. but we are out of time. Out of time. Okay. So come Sorry. and get a full the touch. Yep. Yep. For Keep the conversation <laughs> going. Come and fill yep. this out. Come and write up here. The lights to everyone. And have a break after the Thank you, Mr.